Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We do have some visitors visiting with us. Always glad to have visitors. Some came in because of the radio ministry. They heard us on the radio. Some because of students here at the university. And some just because they dwell in this area. So we appreciate you being here. I want you to know you're welcome. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens. And this is Preacher Edward speaking. I want you to take your Bible and turn to the book of Mark chapter 2. I'll be speaking on the subject, Working Together with the Lord. I think this coming week, the fellowship coming up and the meeting, we need to work together and do all we can to make it a great success. And I hope the message will encourage you to do exactly that. Now, if you'd like to have this tape, you can write in and get it. It'll be tape number 302, uh, Working Together with the Lord. And so I hope you're right in for it, you in the radio listen audience or any other our tape. We have 300 listed. And write in and get a list. And in doing so, write in and get a brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour. If you miss out on this tour, you're going to miss one of the greats. And I've had people say, Preach Edwards, before you discontinue your tours each year, I want to go. Well, this may be the last one coming up. I can't promise you I'll be going anymore after this next one coming up. I won't say I won't, I won't say I will, but it may be. And if you want to get in on the tour, suffice financially to do it. It's one of the greatest. We're going to fly from Atlanta across over to uh, Israel, and we'll be flying on the Swiss Air, uh, most safest airlines you'll find today. Eight days in Israel, wonderful days, two days in London, England. And if you're interested, get a brochure. Some of you listening in the radio listen arts, you ought to send your pastor. No great thing could you do for him. Some of you mothers and dads have her son or daughter that's young in the Lord. Uh, you don't know just what they'll mean to send them. You ought to send them over there. And we'll try to help them in every way possible. Turning now to Mark chapter 2. Remember my mailing address, Virgil Edwards, Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603, is the zip code number. Beginning with verse 1 of Mark 2, page 1047, if you have the kind of Bible I use. And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together in so much that there was no room to receive them, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come and unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man thus speak blasphemous? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easy to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise, and take up thy bed, and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, and took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Now, if you want to see this in an outline form, I'll pass it on to you. Some of you Bible students, preachers, preachers to be, teachers. Let me give you a little uh, seven-point outline here, and you jot it down there in your Bible. I have it jotted down in mine. You have in verse 2, the hearers. You have also in verse uh, 3, uh, two, rather, yes, in verse 3, the helpless. And then you have in verse 4, 
the helpers. And then you have in verse also 4 uh, the uh, hinderers. And then you have the uh, healer there in verse 5. And then, of course, you have the, the uh, harassers in verse uh, 6 and 7, possibly. You can kind of check it out for yourself there. And then number 7, you have the hallelujahs in verse 12. All of these starting with the letter H. And if I didn't give you the exact verse, you can check it out for yourself there. The hearers, the helpless the helpers, the hinders, and the healer, the rationers, and then the hallelujahs. And so you can use that as a beautiful outline. Maybe sometimes you're called on to give a biblical talk or conduct a prayer meeting or speak to someone pertaining to the things of the Bible. You have that beautiful outline there before you, and it can be very helpful. I've used it in my ministry. By the way, I've had a spiritual birthday. 47 years ago yesterday, I made a profession of faith in Christ. It was on uh, October the 24th, 1940, 47 years ago. I didn't dream that 47 years ago that I'd be standing here preaching the gospel today. Someone said, well, you're going to be a preacher. I guess I'd have said, man, you're crazy. But we have to remember the sovereignty of God. I can't figure it out. There's nothing good within me. There's no desire in my heart for spiritual things. And I can only contribute what happened to me in my life to the sovereignty of God. God saw what he wanted to do with this unworthy ball of clay and then God did it. Nothing within me or my strength or power or wisdom. All through the love and sovereignty of our great God. And you must keep that in mind. Now we find several things happening here in this scripture. And I'm bringing the message to encourage you to do something this coming week. To work together with us in getting something done for God. You don't necessarily have to be a member of this church. Work for God. If you can get somebody here and get them under the gospel, get them saved. How wonderful that would be. Get on your phone. Stay on your knees. Knock on doors. Uh, places where you work, invite people. Don't take no for an answer. If need be, take your car and go and bring them in. In a meeting I held many years ago, a man drove an A-model Ford, wore his overhauls every night. He got saved, he and his family. And he brought people, loaded that A-model Ford down every night. And the meeting continued for about two weeks. Eighteen people got saved out of the people he brought. And we had five young preachers to come out of that meeting. And so he just brought people in his car. He couldn't teach or preach or sing. He had no real good personality, but had a good old lay model for it and a good pair of overalls. He'd come right on in bringing people into the meeting. God keeps a record of that. So your labor in God is not in vain. Remember, you find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Everybody that wants to can do something for God if it's nothing but spend your time in prayer. Every born-again Christian can do something for God if they want to. If you're not doing anything for God, it's because you don't want to. God wants you to. God wants you to be doing something for Him. Number one, we see Christ here in the house in verse 1. And again, He entered into Capernaum after some days it was noise that He was in the house. Now, Simon Peter lived here at Capernaum. I've been there. I've seen the old ruins of Simon Peter's home. And the possibility that Jesus was in Simon's house here. I'm not sure about that, but maybe so. But what I want you to see here, that Christ was in the house. Now, I'm sorry to say many of you listening out in the radio listen to us today, Jesus is not in your house. And the reason Christ is not in your house is because you haven't invited him into your heart. And if you don't have Jesus Christ in your heart, if there's no one in your house that has Jesus Christ in their heart, then he's not there. Of course, he knows what's going on there, to be sure. He's omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. He knows exactly what's happening in your home, but he's not welcome there. He's not dwelling there in anybody's heart, but he was dwelling here in this house. And so Jesus was in the house. Do you have a Bible there in your home? If so, you have the Word of God there. When someone comes to your house that are saved, they bring Jesus in. 
when someone in the house is saved, of course, the Lord just moves right in, and he would like to abide in your house. He said to Zacchaeus, today I'm going to abide in your house. Salvation has come to your house. I'm going to abide there today. And he did. So Christ is in the house. I, I want Jesus in my home, and he's there. I, I just begin to realize after God saved me the danger of having a house and Jesus not there. He wasn't welcome in my home until God saved me. Made a profession 47 years ago yesterday, and, I, and uh, Jesus wasn't welcome in my house at all. I had nothing to do with him, had nothing really against him, but he just wasn't there. And if you are not saved, it may be you don't really have anything against the Lord necessarily, but he's not there. If you go to bed tonight and nobody in the house saved, Jesus is not there. I'll tell you, we're living in some dangerous times. I'd, I'd be afraid to go to sleep at night if I didn't know the Lord is in my house. I want him there. Too many things happening. Turbo things are happening. We're moving toward the end of this age. We're moving very fast. And you need to realize that. Unusual things happening. The biggest storm that's hit England in 300 years struck England. Many people died. Those winds came in from different directions and yoked up and, and terrible damage was done. That hadn't, hadn't happened in 300 years. The largest earthquake that's happened this year has happened out in the Pacific just the other day. And many things are happening this day and time that tell us we're moving near the end. Number two, where Christ is doing business, people usually gather. Everywhere the Son of God went, when he did business, people became. And many times he'd have to move on to another place because of the crowds. The Bible says in verse 2, And straightway many were gathered together so much that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. Now they couldn't all get in the house. But Jesus preached the word to them. They could hear him out the door preaching. And he preached to those in the house, those on the outside of the house. And wherever he went doing business, people gathered. And it's still true today. If a church should have a revival, Jesus become real in many hearts. The Spirit of God should take over and people become rejoicing in the Lord. You'd see people coming in the door. They want to come see what it's all about. And many... Christians that's backslid on God have come in to try to get warmed up and get back to God. Now that happens when a church gets on fire. Then of course people usually go to see what it's all about. There's an old man and woman one time lived inside of a church and never put their foot in the church. And one day the church caught on fire and so they were right there, the first ones. Somebody said to him, said, I know, we've never seen you at this church before. He said, no, the church has never been on, in, on, on fire before. Now, if people uh, get on fire in the church building, somebody's going to come in, no doubt about that, see what it's all about. Now, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 49 and verse 10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor lawgiver from between his feet unto shallow come. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, we do know they gathered around Jesus many times, but they're going to gather around him when he comes to the Mount of Olives when the whole nation We'll turn to God in a day, shallow coming. There he came as the Messiah is coming back as Lord of Lords. The Bible said Jesus preached the word unto them. Now if the Son of God preached the word unto them, then that's what was needed. You hear a lot today about our Baptist heritage and got a big stink going about MRSA. And a lot of these liberals and infidels that support MRSA through the cooperative program, you know, they want to save their face and they're screaming and yelling because some fundamentalist that believes the Bible exposed that modernistic thing down there uh, called a uh, university. Uh, so much worldliness and ungodliness going on and they're just, man, they're pulling the hair out down there because uh, uh, a fundamentalist uh, exposed the sin and weakness and error going on at MRSA, a, a liberal university supported by the money of the cooperative program, much of it uh, out of Baptist churches, and a lot of God's people supporting the evil going on down there and don't realize what they're doing. Man, they're raising the devil, writing articles about it in the paper and trying to crucify the man that exposed them. Now they'll do that. Whenever you expose sin and evil and people are wrong, Boy, you're going to uh, scare out more snakes than you can kill right quick like. 
And that's what happened there. That fella stirred out more snakes than he could kill right quick. But I guess he's after them pretty well. But anyway, uh, that's the way it happens. And so, um, uh, you, so whenever you stir up the devil, then he doesn't like it. He doesn't want you to bother his little program. And he's going to fight back every way possible. Like that, that bunch of liberals, you know, that did judge uh, books are dirty. Uh, dirty rascals, many of them uh, guilty of murder and other things and cheating. And, and then uh, condemned that good man that well qualified to be a, a judge. All the political matter and a bunch of crooks, some of them, not all of them, a bunch of crooks took the lead in that. Can a young girl off and getting a drown when he ought to be at home with his wife and young'uns and cheating in college and all that kind of stuff. And the good old people that believe in righteous and right thing are going to remember some of these things when the presidential election comes around they elect the next president. And we need to keep these things in mind. Now the third thing I want to see is the palsied man. In verse 3, they came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy. Now this poor old sick man, he couldn't walk a step. He was helpless. He's a type of a sinner. And no sinner can walk for God. I don't care who he is. He cannot move one foot for God. you got to be saved before you walk one step for God. You're dead in trespassing sins. You might could run a mile. You might could walk all day. But you won't make a step for God. You get saved. Now this man here... He's a type of sinner. The bed speaks of helplessness and suffering. He's on a bed, couldn't do anything, couldn't help himself, couldn't walk, and couldn't get about, and, and uh, he's helpless. The type of bed indicates he was a very poor man. Here's a man that was very poor, very poor man. And he was very much cast down. Matthew chapter 9 and verse 2, he says, Son, be of good cheer. Here's a man that is so cast down. He couldn't walk, he was miserable, he couldn't take care of his family, and just had to be waited on and looked after. And so he's a type of a sinner. A sinner can do nothing for Jesus Christ until he comes to know the Lord. Number four, I'm glad he had four good neighbors. Now that's why we come in today in regard to God's work. God wants us to work together. Work together for the cause of God as born again, fundamental Bible believers. Work together. In verse 3, they came unto him bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. Now these neighbors got together and they said, There's a, a man down here in the house, probably Simon Peter's house, named Jesus. And he's healing people. And he's saving people. He's doing a great work down there. And our old neighbor here, bless his heart, he's been piled up on the bed for years and years. He can't walk a step. He's helpless. And if we could just manage to get him down there, I believe he'd get healed. And those four neighbors got together and they said, I'll tell you what, said, we'll give her a try. And they got together and to give her a try. And so uh, they uh, came unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. They got together to work together. And they had a great determination. They had great faith. In verse 5, when Jesus saw their faith. And then according to your faith, so be it unto you. In Matthew 9, verse 29. And these four men decided if they could get together, they'd get this man to Jesus. And they cooperated together. It took all four of them. Now if one fellow said, well, I'll tell you. My baby's got a cold, and, and all of us family has to stay at home, wipe its nose, and I won't be able to carry my end of the bed, so you just drag my corner on, you three go ahead. But they didn't do that. One of those might have said, well, uh, old Aunt, Aunt Jane is having a, her reunion today, and so we won't uh, uh, bother about going. Uh, my family always goes to that reunion, whether we got death in the family or not. And uh, so you just drag my in along, get there the best way you can. No, no. They work together. In order to get the work of God done, you got to be faithful in serving God. Be found at the post of duty. You can't trot around all over the country and go everywhere you want to go on the Lord's day and neglect your church and expect God to bless it and expect uh, God to build a strong church. It takes faithfulness, good, faithful people. Have a young man back there told me this morning, said, Brother Edwards, I used to come down here. Uh, with the pots 
I'm going to tell you right now, Coot and Fleet of Potts is two of the greatest people I've ever associated with in my life. They're in heaven together today, and brother, nothing kept them out of the house of God. I mean, you'd have to tie Coot Potts down in the bed to keep it. I know them to come out of the hospital and leave the hospital and come on to church. You could you couldn't stop them good people. I've known them come slide in here on ice in the wintertime whenever people across the street couldn't make it to church. They slide all the way in from Jefferson, be sitting right out here in the yard when the door opened. Greatest, some of the greatest people, two of the greatest people I've ever known in my life. And this good young man came with him a few times. That's why he's back here today. He appreciated him, I'm sure. Great with those people. Would to God, if I, if I had 50 people like them, I couldn't behave myself. I wouldn't know how to act. I really wouldn't. We got some good people. Don't misunderstand me, but I'm talking about 50 just like them. I wouldn't know what to do. We wouldn't know how to act. I, I guess I'd just have a spell and, and a shouting spell about every time I came to the church. Anyway, they had great faith. Call your faith, so be it unto you. And what they had not, of, of course, if they had not tried to get, get, gotten this man to Christ, then he would not have been healed. Several years ago, and I say this to the glory of God, and I'm sure if the man was alive today, he wouldn't mind me saying this. I'm sure his relatives won't mind me saying it because I say this to the glory of God. When I first went to Union Point and uh, worked with those good people down there and started that work, the Bethel Baptist Church, there's a man down there, I guess, criticizing me and talked about me and cussed me and, and opposed me. I guess as strong, if not stronger, than most anyone else that I knew about. And for years he did that. Oh, he cussed me. He didn't like old preacher Edwards. No, no, no. Well, the dear man, uh, his health got bad. And here some year or two ago, I went down to the hospital in Greensburg and won the man to God. His Lord is saved and became one of my best friends and loved me dearly. And he went through a lot of sickness and and I had a lot of problems since that time, but he found the Lord Jesus and always glad to see me come around after God saved him. See, the Lord made the difference. Now, I'll be preaching that man's funeral this afternoon at 3 o'clock in the Bethel Baptist Church there at Union Point. And so I wanted to show you how God changed that man, one of my biggest critics, to one of my good friends, a man that loved me and appreciated me winning him to God. So when you get people saved, that makes a difference. That is the difference. And God can save people and make a big difference and change them all the way around. Number five, notice the opposition. Verse four, you have the crowd. They could not come nigh him for the press. Now, a lot of times the crowd will get in the way. And uh, we had some two great preachers. They had a minister somewhat similar. They'd gone on to be with the Lord. That's the late Joe Parsons and the late B.B. Uh, Caldwell. Now, I've heard those two men of God, and they've meant a lot to me. Uh, they said, Preacher, don't worry about the crowd. said, What we need to do is get rid of some of them so we can have a good meeting. He said, We can have a far better meeting if we can get rid of some of the people just coming in uh, just to be going somewhere than we could uh, if we just had the few that love God and want to hear the word and do something for God. Well, I didn't argue with them about that, but they those are the two men never worried about the attendance. They'd rather have a small crowd than a big crowd any time, but you won't find many preachers like that. But here they couldn't get near Jesus for the crowd, and sometimes the crowd will hinder you. I've been in the churches where they had revivals and days gone by, you couldn't hardly get in the house. If you got in, you couldn't move. It's so packed out, and you couldn't hear anything a preacher said. Now the crowd got in the way. Now a crowd can get in the way. If you got too many people, then get in the way. That's what happened here. Verses... Um, uh, 6 and 7, verse 4, rather, they could not come down of him for the press. There's so many people there. They couldn't get this poor old palsied man through that big crowd to get him to Jesus. The crowd is in the way. And many times the crowd can get in the way and hinder the cause of God. Then you had the opposition not only from the crowd but from the scribes. Verses 6 and 7, and there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why does this man thus speak blasphemous who can forgive sins but God only? Now these old scribes pull in their whiskers and said, Now while that man there, he talked about forgiving sin, said, Well, nobody can do that but God. Well, he gave, forgave the man of his sins, so it must have been God. So that gave him, them the lockjaw. The man was a very sick man, and he healed him. And so the old scribes said, Well, who is he to heal anybody? 
And who is he to forgive sins? And who is this man anyway? We've been studying the law all our lives. We, we can't figure him out. We can't place him in the law. And uh, he just, he's out of tune. Uh, and we just, he, he's not in the mainstream. That's what they said about Judge Bork, you know. He's not in the mainstream. Some of the greatest judges in the United States said if he wasn't in the mainstream, we were not in the mainstream. But anyway, that's beside the point. And then number six, the great Savior. What a wonderful Savior. Now this great Savior received this man. He honored their faith in verse 5. And immediately he arose. Verse 12. And immediately he arose. It didn't take all day to get this man saved. No sir. Immediately he arose. It didn't take all day for God to heal this man. Some of these uh, charlatans today. These religious racketeers you know. Claim to heal people. But say now. Uh, you, you can hear a little better. Can you walk a little? Just take a few little tiny steps. And now can you, you take a little broader step? Now can you straighten up a little better? Oh, you're getting healed. Well, when God heals somebody, it'll take him all day to do it. Like the little boy went into the blacksmith shop. And the old blacksmith was hammering away on a horseshoe. And it was about red hot. And he laid it down there. The little boy always sticks his nose in something he shouldn't. Walked in and picked up that red hot horseshoe, and by the time he picked it up, he dropped it. And the blacksmith said, Well, son, said, uh, that thing went hot, wasn't it? He said, Well, it just don't take me all day to look at a horseshoe. Well, we need to realize that sometimes things can happen, you know, pretty quick. Like the man sitting at the table eating potatoes. He wanted to get in and get started eating, and took him out a big old spoonful of hot uh, iced potatoes and crammed them in his mouth. and Man about to burn him real good, and he know what to do, and he just took him out of his mouth and laid him down beside his plate, and it embarrassed him. So he said to the fellow beside him, they said, you know, a lot of fools have swallowed that, you know. <laughs> well, uh, I guess that, that happens sometimes, but anyway, it doesn't take Jesus, but just a matter of seconds to save a man. And immediately he saved the man. He's a great savior. And then Christ read the thoughts of the scribes and Pharisees, verse 8, and immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned with themselves, he said unto them, Why reason those things in your heart? See, Jesus looked right down in the hearts of those scribes and Pharisees. He knew there's a bunch of devils, and he knew what they were thinking. And uh, he said to the man then, Arise, they said only God can forgive sins. Verse 7, Who can forgive sins but God only? And Jesus said, I said to thee, Arise. Now he was God, that's why he could forgive sins. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 9, The Lord our God belongeth mercies and forgiveness. And so he could save the man, have mercy on him. He can forgive our sins because he died for us and give us power to walk because he rose again and lives forever. Now Jesus did his part. Now there's certain things we can do and certain things Jesus will do himself. Now we can do certain things. We can get people out here doing this meeting coming up, get them all influence the gospel, God reaches their heart, then you're doing some soul winning. Now, Jesus didn't raise Lazarus out of the grave till they moved the stone out of the way. Now, they could do that. Jesus said, you get that stone out of the way, and I'll do what you can't do. And they rolled the stone out of the way, and Jesus said, come out of there, Lazarus. He came out. Now, there's certain things you can do. You can be faithful. You can be here and be here on time. I forgot to tell the people this morning, uh, those it's always late not to bother about the clocks, but... Those on time, they could move them back an hour. But I failed to tell them, and some of them was late anyway. All right. Now, we need to realize that uh, Jesus can save people in the spur of the moment. And we can work together next week during the meeting and be here on time, be here for prayer, be here for the service, and be propped and pray during the day and work for God as we sojourn. Finally, the unusual happened that day in verse 12. They were all amazed. And glorify God said, we never saw it on this fashion. We never saw it on this fashion. They never seen things just like that. Luke chapter 5, verse 26, and they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and with fear with fear said, We have seen strange things today. Now God can still show us some unusual things and some strange things. And He will if we'll let Him. But we got to be willing to do our part. Now let me ask you this question: Are you willing? To carry your end of the corner. Are you willing to do your part in getting God's work done on the earth? Are you willing to do that? 
Are you expecting somebody else to carry your part? You ought to be faithful. Do your part in helping get people here. Be proudful. Do your part financially. Do your part everywhere you can. Get the job done for God. Now they saw some strange things that day. They saw a ten-legged man brought in. That is, he had two of his own and, and eight he was using from four other fellows. And they saw a quartet that raised the roof off the house. They just took the roof right off that house, laid him down in front of Jesus. They saw the locked jaw of the scribes and Pharisees. They saw a man carrying a bed that once carried him. A man, as a man thinketh, in his heart so is he. And they saw a man thanking God that he had the palsy because he praised God because he had it, he got saved. In Psalms 119, verse 71, it's good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. He saw a man going home, a new creation by the power of God. It was good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. I say this in closing. On, on October the 16th, I was struck down flat on my back. October the 24th, made profession of faith in Christ. I wrote a little book on my life story. It's out of print now. I might redo it sometimes. But anyway, uh, I put that verse scripture in there. It was good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. God struck me down, put me flat on my back. I was running from something. I won't go into detail about that now. And God spoke to my heart. And so no doubt this man said it was good that I was afflicted, that I got saved, and God healed me. And so a man going home now to a new family, a new creation by the power of God. He's a different man. He got that old pallet, a bed on his shoulder, and coming down the road very brisky. His wife and children maybe saw him coming and said, I wonder who in the world, and that can't be daddy. Oh, he, he's walking, but he was. He come in shouting the hinges off the doors, praising God because God had healed him and God had saved him. Let me give you this in closing. There's a barber in a village one time, greatly loved by all the people. Everybody knew old Sam the barber. And uh, he cut all the men's hair and the children. And Sam went out fishing one day in his boat. His boat capsized, turned over. Under the water he went, and they... Couldn't find him. They drowned. Poor old Sam, the barber, drowned. They started looking for him. They paid uh, divers $100 a day to search for his body. The whole town knew him and appreciated him. They covered the bank of the lake up, and they searched and they searched. After about four days, they found Sam's body. When they found his body and had it ready for the funeral, somebody overheard the preacher say these words. The preacher said, Sam, if the people in this village had been as much concerned about your soul as it were your body, Sam, you wouldn't be in hell today. Let's stand our feet.